I'll share a little bit about myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Mara Walsh. I am in the United States and specifically between Philadelphia and New York. This is in the Eastern time zone. So if you are converting time for any reason, you can use either New York or Philadelphia to figure out your time of the time of the tour in your own region. When we're not traveling virtually, I host groups on physical tours as well as help others plan their own family and group vacations. Don't let the name Girl Travel Tours fool you. We welcome everyone on our tours, not just girls. Uh, the name came about because I started leading physical tours with EF Tours as a Girl Scout leader, but now I lead tours for all ages, teens through senior citizens. Uh, many of my tours are adult only tours and I use many tour operators. But when COVID struck, we were unable to travel physically, so I started traveling with my tour director friends virtually. I really wanted to support the tour director community during this time of travel restriction where they were not able to work. And I really wanted to keep the spirit of travel alive for my travel group and also for those of you who have found out about us through Facebook, family, friends, and other means. And thankfully, these virtual tours have served both purposes very well. We've done about 75 since the start of COVID. If you'd like to go back and access any of the recordings, they're available on my website, girltraveltours.com. They're also available on my YouTube channel and Facebook page. We have several more tours planned for this coming year. Many are listed on my website for you to register. I have added several for 2022 and um, we're adding more and more as we go along. We have next week, uh, Bucharest, we're going back to Romania. We have Piedmont, Italy, the Canyon Countries, the US National Parks Tour, Marque, Italy, Madrid, Slovenia, and Cayman Islands. And I have more to add to the, to the mix as well. As long as you're interested in viewing these virtual tour presentations, we will continue to produce them for you. I wanna review a few ways for you to interact with us. Feel free to ask questions about this tour, the tour director or my physical travel program in the Q&A. And we will read those off after the presentation and we'll deal with those questions live so that you can hear the answers. If you have a comment or a question for me, feel free to put them in the chat and I will answer you back during the tour. If you're on Facebook, you wanna leave a post, that's fine too, interact with the audience and have a good time with it. I'd like to also in include an interactive poll, which I often do for all of our tours. This gives us an understanding of your connection with the region. And this week's virtual tour is um, coming to us from Scotland. So the question is, what is your connection to Scotland? I thought it was a little safer than asking you what your connection to Scotch whiskey is. So I have been and love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the location, or I am solely interested in experiencing it virtually. I was fortunate enough to be on my last large group tour, and we did Scotland. Um, so I was, I was happy to have that as one of my last tours. And I have Scotland, um, a, a good tour of Scotland and the uh, Highlands coming up for those of you who may be interested in a physical tour. So I think I've given you enough time to answer. Let's see what the poll says. We're going to share the results and it's about 44% have been and loved it. I'm in that group. Um, I have travel booked only 3%. I think we're gonna change some opinions after today's presentation. Uh, we have plenty of people who plan to go in the future. And then of course we have our virtual travelers which we're always welcome to have here week after week. So I'm gonna stop sharing. If you still see it up on your screen, you can click off the uh, little, little box on the top and that'll clear it from your screen. Today's tour, like all of our tours, are scheduled for 90 minutes plus a Q&A. So hopefully you're ready for this presentation. Um, you may even have a nice piece of, or a nice little bit of Scotch whiskey to sip on. I did include in the chat, I hope you're seeing it, 
some recommendations from Austin on what you might want to accompany the tour with today. But feel free to sip on anything, whether it's scotch whiskey, whether it's wine, or my old faithful water. Um, a tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour director. And we are lucky today to have back with us Austin, who is a fan favorite from Scotland. Uh, he is going to take us on a very unique journey today. I'll share with you via chat and during the Q&A how you can tip the tour guide. If you appreciate this presentation and our guide's knowledge and wit, I will tell you that all the tips go directly to the guide once collected minus the Zoom operating expenses. So today I wanna to introduce you to Austin and welcome you back Austin to our program. Austin, hello, welcome. Feel free to come on and take the control. I, Share I, your I, screen I, and I let it go. Agree. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just going to close down. I just answered somebody in the chat who said they couldn't find the whiskies and just explaining that it's right at the very start of the chat you've put it in. Uh, I'll put hello. it in again, Austin. I'll, I'll put it in there again. And, uh, and I, I reckon most people are not going to have the whiskies that I'm going to talk about at the end of this. So what I suggest to everyone is if you enjoyed it, but you don't have the whiskies, I've seen some interesting whiskies already. I've seen some Lafroigs and some Duras and someone being quite apologetic about Duras blended whiskey, never apologize about Scotch whiskey. It's lovely whether it's uh, whether it's a single malt or whether it's a blend, it's all good. There's Talisker Das Dark Storm just come up as well in the panel. So what I reckon is if you don't have the whiskies and I've piqued your interest, I have picked whiskies that um, are easy to get around the world, easy to get in miniature around the world, um, and there's nothing incredibly challenging uh, about them, but they are all very different in their own right. So, as you know, Mara, I'm a bit of a Luddite. Let's see if I can get the share screen up. And this is me here, I believe. How does that look? You're perfect, Austin. Fantastic, yes. <laughs> Tell my wife that. <laughs> um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, my name's Austin, as Mara says. I am a tour director, um, and I am based in Glasgow in Scotland, which is the largest city in Scotland, and it's on the West Coast. I first came became involved with Mara and Girl Travel Tours because she asked me to do an Iceland tour almost a year ago now. So if you're interested at the end of this, I have also done an Iceland tour last March and I did a Scotland tour of the West Coast um, uh, in July, I believe it was. So what are we going to do today? Here we are. So there's some basic things. I wanted to give you a basic background of Scotland. Some of you, of course, have been, others haven't. Some are planning trips and some are just wanted to see it virtually. I wanted to give you an idea of when's good to come and when's not good to come. Kind of who are the Scots in a very, very broad sense. How do you get to Scotland? What's good hacks and interesting ways of getting around once you get to Scotland? I have some few good websites and things for you. And Mara also has a, a sheet that I have sent out that she can send on to you with all the links. Then we're going to go on to whiskey. I'm going to tell you how Scotch whiskey is made. I'm going to tell you some really interesting, frequently asked questions about whiskey. And then at the end, very quickly, I'm going to show you some interesting places in the five different Scotch whiskey regions that you could go to. And then we're going to have a little drink of whiskey at the end. So whatever you have with you, just drink along with me. I'll tell you about the regions, their characteristics, and then if I've piqued your interest, you can go out and find these whiskies. They're all there in the chat. They'll all be listed on this presentation. So let's get started. Where are we? Okay, let's go very, very simple. Here is Europe. The UK is in the island on the top left-hand corner, well, underneath Iceland. It's the blue country there. Scotland is one of the four nations within the United Kingdom. So it's the United, of Kingdom, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The red part of Ireland on the left there is Northern Ireland. Those are six counties that still belong to the United Kingdom. Scotland is in the north 
of the United Kingdom and is part of basically like your like the like the the US federal states within one United States. So it's four countries within one. Scotland is not an independent country, though it does have its own capital, which is Edinburgh, which everybody comes to when they visit. Scotland has eight administrative regions, and it's mainly the big cities are around the outside of the of the of the country. So you can see on this, um, Glasgow is on the left at the bottom in Strathclyde. Edinburgh is very close on the right hand side in Lothian. These are the two big administrative regions. And if you look above Glasgow and Edinburgh, you see Stirling. These three cities are in an area of Scotland called the Central Belt. And the Central Belt is not where the greatest whiskies are made. We'll come on to this right now. There are five whisky regions, okay? Looks like there's six, but there aren't. There's five whisky regions. And at the end of the tour, I'm going to take you round each one of them. I'm going to explain the differences between them and have a little drink. So you can see there are lowlands, the red, there are highlands, the yellow. There is Speyside, which is the most popular style of whiskey in the whole world, Scotch whiskey in the whole world. That's the orange one there. Ignore the part that says islands, they're part of the highlands. And then you have the two tiny whiskey regions that really pack a punch in the whiskey business. We have Campbelltown, which has been spelled wrongly. It has a P missing from it. And then you have Isla. Isla on the west coast there, that little blue island. Um, apologies to anybody who has named their child that and then has uh, pronounced the name differently. In Scots, it's Isla. But I hear all manner of different pronunciations. And being a huge fan of uh, Beyonce myself, I sometimes call it Isley. So where are we going next? Let's look at when is a good time to come to Scotland. So I, I really like these pictures. When is a good time to come to Scotland? Well, basically any time is a good time as no one comes here for the weather. People who've been here before may be able to look at that picture past the soaking wet people with their umbrellas up and realize that that is Stirling Castle in the background. That Stirling Castle, uh, one of the most beautiful castles in the whole of Scotland, but nobody comes here for, uh, for do you know what? It's, it's such, it's so full of Scotch mist, it's actually Edinburgh Castle looking at the Esplanade there. I'm pretty sure that's, that's so hard to tell with the really, really bad weather. So that's Edinburgh Castle, the largest castle in Scotland over on the East Coast. Stirling Castle looks exactly like it, but it's smaller in the centre of the country. So yeah, basically we don't get good weather. As we always say here, there's no such thing as bad weather, just the wrong clothes. And sometimes we do get weather that is absolutely beautiful. So I wanted to include some of these pictures. We have this ruined castle at the top on a loch here. And then we have the beautiful autumnal colours at the bottom. On the bottom here, this is a side of Loch Lomond, which is the largest fresh water lake in the whole of the UK by surface area. It's awfully good to come to Scotland in autumn as well. Of course, in North America, you will call it fall. And this is when the heather is in bloom. Now, I've not included the heather in this first photograph. We're going to come on to it. This first photograph shows you what certainly North Americans tend to call leaf peeping. These are the beautiful autumnal colours of uh, the country as we move from the summer towards the winter. And in fact, um, if I can quote the great Bill Watterson and Calvin and Hobbes, Ca uh, Hobbes always calls this time of year nature's fireworks display. So here is what I was talking about there. Coming to Scotland in the autumn when the heather is in bloom. Heather is a short, scrubby, purple plant, plant that you can see here in the foreground of this picture. You can see much more what it actually looks like all over the heathlands of Scotland. It turns the whole place sort of purple and beige and dark brown as it starts to change over the, uh, over the autumn. An amazing time to come. 
The bees are just finishing off at the end of the year. They are still sucking out the nectar from the honey and creating beautiful heather honey that you can get here in Scotland. So this is, this is one of the moors in the north of Scotland where heather is really, really in bloom. It's a wonderful time to come and see it out of the heat of the summer and out of the really, really busy times that I'm going to come on to in a second. A few more pictures of Scotland in the autumn, between lochs and between rivers and between old abandoned bridges and pine forests there with the sun shining through. Really is a beautiful country to come and see. So is there maybe a time I should think twice about coming? Well, here is my advice. Feel free to absolutely ignore it. Edinburgh in August. For anybody who's been to um, Scotland and has experienced Edinburgh in August, it is quite a crazy time. Edinburgh's population in August swells from half a million people to 1.5 million people. And you do feel like you're sardines in a can. This is for one particular reason. Holiday hotels, Airbnbs, and, uh, and holiday lets and hotels are a huge premium this time of year, and they are incredibly hard to get and incredibly busy to, uh, expensive to, um, to rent. And it's because, oh, I, I think I've missed out a, a picture. Basically, what I'm trying to say is this. Edinburgh in August, turns into this, you can see how busy it is. This is the center of the old town of Edinburgh, and this is part of the Edinburgh Festival. It starts in the first week of August and continues to the end. It is a huge international festival. It has a film festival. It has a fringe festival as well. The Fringe Festival is basically thousands and thousands of performances in anywhere from a concert hall right through to at some years there have been performances as small as in telephone kiosks, public lavatories, backs of taxis, tiny little units with only maybe five or six people in them. When you come to Edinburgh in August, everybody is there. The performers are there, the tourists are there, the locals are there, everyone is grumpy at you. But if it's your kind of thing and you love the hustle and the bustle of the, uh, the city. It's absolutely incredible. But bear in mind, it's really busy. You can't get a moment to yourself and you can't turn around. There's also a huge comedy festival goes on at that time as well. If you're great fans of comedy, I saw some people from uh, Canada in and from Quebec. And obviously there's Just for Laughs in Montreal in Quebec. It's a huge comedy festival. Edinburgh has the largest comedy festival in the world. All of these great comedians. And I just couldn't resist. The two guys in the top right, right hand corner are my friends, Johnny and Paddy. And they are Johnny and the Baptists. They are great comedians. And the girl underneath with her hand and a claw is my friend Josie, who is Johnny's partner. They're all amazing comedians here in Scotland. So there's that festival on top of the International Festival, on top of the, uh, the Film and Television Festival. It's all going on in Edinburgh. So that's my advice. It's not the greatest time to come in the year. But if you really enjoy the hustle, the bustle and the busyness and you want to see lots and lots of international acts, it's a great time to see anything. Great. So, OK, I'm in. What's this we country all about? As you probably know, we don't say small or little in Scotland. We say we. So what's our we country all about? On the left hand side, this is an English comedian called Russ Abbott, who used to do a kind of really funny character called Jimmy McJimmy. It was a stereotypical Scotsman. He's got his kilt on and he's got his beer in his hand and he's got his ginger hair. So what is Scotland all about? Scotland has a population of about 5.6 million. To put that into context, England, our partner country, has a population of about 58 million. So 10 times as many as us here. But we still pack a punch. 
we also we like to have fun. Here are some uh, Scots all dressed up in their kilt, and these hats are called CU Jimmy hats, and they are inspired by Russ Abbott himself. We like to have fun. We really enjoy ourselves. What are our main industries? Our main industries are fishing, as you can see in the top there, oil and gas, the North Sea of the, pardon me, the North Sea of the East Coast of Scotland is full of oil and gas. The fields are still going strong. They will run out eventually, of course, but they're going strong. So there's a lot of industry in the oil and gas there. On the left here, I have used these amazing statues. They are the largest equine horse statues in the whole of Europe, I believe. I think there's a bigger one in America. Um, these are called the Kelpies, and they are in the centre of Scotland, just outside the town of Falkirk. Um, they've been there for about 15 years, and they're amazing. You can actually walk inside them, and they're there to represent that tourism plays a huge part in what we do here in Scotland. Um, the Kelpies, the legend is that they were um, sort of malevolent spirits, so they were evil spirits who manifested themselves as a horse. And what they would do is they would come into the woods and they would find children and they would speak to children and they would offer them a ride on their back. And as soon as the child got on, they were mesmerized and the Kelpies would take them into the water and eat them. So that's the Kelpies. That's one of our folk tales in, the whole, in Scotland. Of course, the other main industry, and how could we forget it, is whiskey. 4.4 billion pounds of exports every year for the Scotch whiskey sector, and that's growing year on year on year. There are 39 bottles of whiskey exported from Scotland every second. That's probably slowed down a little bit due to COVID, but you know, it's keeping going. Um, I wanted to talk about like the, the ethnic diversity that we have here in Scotland as well. I live in Glasgow. I live on the south side of Glasgow and I live in an area called Cross Hill. It's incredibly multicultural around here. So my neighbours upstairs are um, Muslims of Pakistani origin. My neighbours through the wall are Hindus of Indian origin as well. So you can see I've tried to show these different races that we have living here side by side in Scotland. So of these four pictures, the bottom right-hand corner are Scottish Muslims. They're actually wearing the Scottish Muslim tartan, which was specially designed for that race. Above them, the man in the kilt there, he is a Scottish, um, uh, Scottish Sikh. He's a, um, he's a Scottish chef. He owns a restaurant here in Glasgow. And I've forgotten his like Tommy Singh is his name. He does amazing food and he's part of the Sikh community. We now have two Sikh temples in Glasgow, one on the north of the city and one on the south close to where I live. In the corner as well, in the top left hand corner, that's, a, that's an, a, an Anglo Hindu wedding in Scotland, in Glasgow in fact, that's in a park called Pollock Park. That's some Indian Hindu men and some Scottish men all in traditional dress. And then in the bottom left hand corner, that is part of our Jewish community. Glasgow has a very, very strong Jewish community who originally started when they came to this country, when they, they fled Europe at the turn of the 20th century. They came to my area, they came to Govan Hill and Cross Hill, they set up a synagogue, they built up a, they built up a community here, and then ultimately they have moved just outside of Glasgow to an area called Gifnock, where they have their own new synagogue again, so a big, strong Jewish community here in Glasgow as well. But of course, for the most part, we are still white and we are still European British people. The two main religions here are still Catholic and Protestants. So at the bottom here, we have the Catholic bishops when they were having a seminary here in Glasgow. And at the top, I have a couple of Church of Scotland ministers. I chose this picture because the picture on the left is my best friend's father. His name is Stuart Smith, and he was the minister at my local church for around 30 years until he retired. His name is Stuart Smith. He's a Church of Scotland minister, 
I'm still best friends with his son. So in Scotland, Protestant and Catholic rivalries tends to work its way out on the football pitch. Yes, I'm saying football pitch. I'm not saying that S word. We play football here in Scotland. In Glasgow, we have two major football teams. They're big, big rivals. I don't like to get involved in telling you like which side I support, but if I just tell you the names of them, the team that plays in red, white, and blue, you can see their crest there at the top, and you can see their blue shirt just below, are Glasgow Rangers, and the team that play in green and white hoops um, and play in a place called Parkhead or Paradise are the mighty, mighty Glasgow Celtic Football Club. Yes, I'm wearing a green T-shirt. <clears throat> There's a huge sporting rivalry here in, in Scotland, bigger than you could probably even imagine if you're in North America and you maybe think of somewhere like uh, the New York Jets and the Mets. Not the Jets, the Mets. Uh, there's two big New York teams in North America and American football. If you think of a rivalry like that and multiply it by about 100, that's the rivalry that we get in my city between Rangers and Celtic. On the other side of the country, we also have a rivalry of the same lines. We have a Protestant and Catholic rivalry here as well. We have Hearts and we have Hibs. Hearts are the team playing in purple, the colour of a heart, probably and Hibs play in green. So there's huge rivalries between the Catholics and Protestants here in Scotland. It's hard to get your head around when you come for the first time. Also, I don't know if any of you watch this programme. I absolutely love it. It's called Succession. Succession is all about a dysfunctional, rich family who own a huge media empire. The patriarch of the family is Logan Roy. He's sitting there in the middle, played by Brian Cox. His backstory is that he was Scots and he came from Dundee. At one point, you discover that his favourite team is Hibernian Football Club from Edinburgh. That was the green team that we saw in the last slides there. Unfortunately, his idiot son, Roman, gets it wrong and decides for a birthday present he's going to buy him Heart of Midlothian Football Club, the huge rivals. This is just something that would never happen in Scotland. It's really funny to watch for a, a local like myself in a big American programme. So that makes sense, I hope. He likes one team, they bought him the other team. He's really, really angry. So that's kind of a bit yeah, there he is. He's not happy. He's never happy in the programme, actually, Logan Roy. I've never seen him smile. Great. That's a little bit of background about Scotland. I'm happy to answer questions as we go. So this all sounds great. How do I get here? If you're coming to Scotland, we have two major international airports. We have, two, we have many smaller airports that also do international flights, but the two main are Glasgow in the west and Edinburgh in the east. They are about 45 miles apart, so it almost doesn't matter where you land. When I work as a tour director, I get people from driving in Glasgow that I take to Edinburgh, and conversely, I get people in Edinburgh that I take to Glasgow. Excuse me a second. So, if you're already here, say you're in England and you want to travel to Scotland, there is a vast rail network all through the country. It takes about four and a half hours to travel by train from Glasgow to Edinburgh and slightly longer to go to Glasgow, maybe five hours. So we have a great rail network here that will take you all around the country. Also, we have great scenic railway journeys here in Scotland and you can get around the whole of Scotland by rail. Sometimes you're ultimately going to end up on a bus but for the most part, you are on a train. I've just put this map in here of great scenic railway journeys, and I'm going to show you some pictures of them in a little bit. So I said that there's some supporting uh, files with this tour, which I have given to Mara. So if you want to get round Scotland by train, you would be using this website. And this website is ScotRail. And it has a ticket there that you can buy, which is called the Spirit of Scotland. This will give you several journeys around the country. 
and you can use it for a month at a time. So here is, this is a picture of the website. Mara has the actual links to the website as well. Of course, if you just put in Scott Trail Spirit of Scotland into Google, it will open right up. So that's one way of getting around Scotland is to use actual um, cumulative tickets that you can buy. How else can you do it? Well, this is the whole Scottish route, including all the scenic ones as well. You can get all the way from the south of Scotland right up to the very north by train. It's a great way to get around. It's not terribly expensive. It's very comfortable. And let's face it, if you're going to be visiting some Scotch whiskey distilleries, you might not want to be driving all the time. There's another type of ticket you can buy for ScotRail and it's called the Highland Rover. So the Highland Rover does exactly the same thing, but it's 95 pounds and it takes you all over the Highlands of Scotland, which is basically north of Stirling and right up to the top of the country. So it's, it's a great, it's a four day pass that you can use. You really easy to buy. And again, it's easily Googleable and I've sent the, the things in. What can you see? On the train. Well, on the right hand picture here, this is basically probably the most famous rail journey in the whole of Scotland. This train is travelling over the Glen Finnan Viaduct. Glen, Glen Finnan is in the west of the Highlands, and those of you who are fans of Harry Potter will know that it's used on the way to Hogwarts as well. You can see there's a steam train there. The train goes basically from Fort William in the north, central, right out to Malig on the west coast. And from Malig, you can actually take ferries to lots of the islands in the inner and outer Hebrides. I'm coming on to that as well. The train on the left-hand side, well, first of all, those beautiful yellow plants you can see all over that picture are gorse. So that tells me it's sort of springtime in Scotland. And in the background, you can see the Forth Bridge. That's the rail bridge that goes over the Firth of Forth, which is uh, an opening of seawater between Lothian in the south and Fife in the north. That rail journey is absolutely stunning and going over the Forth Bridge as well is quite amazing. So you might also want to go to the Western Isles the Outer and the Inner Hebrides. So here are the islands over here on the left-hand side of this picture. The Outer Hebrides are the ones that say Lewis, Harris, North, South Uist, Benbecula and Barra. And the Inner Hebrides are all the other ones. You've probably heard of Skye. You've definitely heard of Isla, if you're fans of, uh, if you're fans of uh, whiskey. And let's face it, you've probably heard of Mull as well. Um, how do you get out to the islands? Well, let me tell you, there is a great website and a great company called CalMac, Caledonian MacBrain. And on this website, again, it's easily Googleable and we're sending you the information. This gives you all your different options for tickets. And you can see down at the bottom left-hand corner, they actually have a ticket called a Whiskey Hopscotch. That's a ticket that will take you on several ferries around the Western Isles to different islands that have distilleries on them. So Jura has a distillery, uh, Mull has two distilleries, Isla has 14 distilleries on it, takes you around there. And also you can see just above it to the right, there's a five ferry ticket. So to give you an idea, you've had those, you've been on there, and you've found Calmac, and that's what you're doing with your, uh, that's what you're doing with your stay. You can get the whiskey hopscotch, you can get the five tickets. You can use that all for the whole of your stay. As I say, links are in the information that Mara has. But hey, what if you're filthy rich? Can you get around the country by another way? Yes, you certainly can. So here's a website for Scotland's local airline, and they're called Logan Air. They fly out of all of the airports on mainland Scotland, and they fly to most of the islands. There is their routes. I'll go back one, actually, I think, if I can go, can't go back, excuse me a sec. I'll just go back there so you can see Logan Air. Information is all in the handout that Mara is going to have. 
they fly four or five times a day to lots of different islands all over the country. They can also fly you from Glasgow to Inverness in 30 minutes. So you can get around there by air as well if you really want to do that. There is their, um, there's all the places they fly to. So they fly right out to the Western Isles, Stornoway, Bembecula and Barra. All of those islands are either connected by short ferries or small bridges. So you can go up and down there and they'll fly you out to Isla as well. If you're a really, really passionate whiskey fan, you can pick up their website really easy, Logan Air. Here's something else I wanted to include. There's a company just north of Glasgow called Loch Lomond Seaplanes. They are literally that. They are a seaplane and they will do you trips basically just up in the air and they will fly you over Scotland. They will fly you over the islands for an hour or two hours. It's really worth having a look at as well, particularly if you want a bit of adventure. So, are there any good local resources I can use before I get there? And I loved, I loved having the opportunity of using this guy's picture. He's such a meme. Are there any local resources you can use? Yes, there is. This is the biggest local resource you can use. This is the website called Visit Scotland. You see it on the left-hand side there. Visit Scotland can tell you everything you need to know about going to Scotland. Um, everything from COVID safety, how we're doing at the moment, uh, accommodation, reviews of accommodation, how to get about the country, what websites to use, how to find the correct buses, how to use local buses. I've included information about local buses in my handout as well. But it has everything. So if you want to know about anything in Scotland, the Visit Scotland website has the answer. But I also wanted to include a couple of other things. This is an absolutely fantastic blog, which I've also put a link into. It's called Secret Scotland. This is just a screenshot, but you can see if you've got three to five days in Scotland, you can click that six to eight, nine, however long you have. And then you submit it and it will start to give you suggested itineraries that you might want to do in Scotland. It's a really, really good resource and you can start to see things. And if you start to say, I want to be in the Northwest Highlands, it will start to give you little bits of information that you might not have known about if you'd not been there before. I'm going to give you a few quirky destinations at the end of this tour as well. But that's the Secret Scotland blog. Loads of information, loads of help, lots of accommodation, tours, everything there. Two great companies that work in Scotland are these two. This is Rabbi's Tours. People who have been before may have come across Rabbi's Tours. They are amazing. They have such personal guides. They have such small group tours. You feel like you're a local when you're on them. They are really, really good. Rabbi's Tours all information included in the handout. And the last one, just over on the left, Haggis Adventures. Now, you, we all know what haggis is, don't we? It's an amazing food that comes from Scotland and it's made out of magic, absolutely out of magic. Haggis Tours do the same thing as Rabbi's, but they're a smaller company, so they're even more personal. Um, these are all really good resources if you want to come to the country. So I hope they can be of use and I hope you can get the handout and work from that if you're coming to the country. So anyway, enough of my yakking. Let's get on with the whiskey, shall we? This photograph on the left hand side is the still house in a distillery called the Clyde Side Distillery. This is where I'm working at the moment as a whiskey tour guide. Um, I do everything from doing tours on whiskey to doing tours on whiskey and chocolate to selling people whiskey in the shop. It's an absolute dream job. The Clydeside Distillery is the first distillery inside the city of Glasgow for over 100 years, and I'm so proud to work there. So let's get on with it. I want to tell you really briefly how we make whiskey. Some of you may know this already, but wherever you go in the world, wherever you're making whiskey, there are only ever three ingredients. 
there's basically water, barley, and yeast. Now that's for Scotch whiskey. North America and other places, sometimes you swap out grain or corn or rye for the barley. And sometimes in Scotland, we use grain as well. But it's basically water, a starchy seed, and yeast. And that's it. How do we go about doing it? Right. There are seven stages for making whiskey. Malting, milling, mashing, fermenting, distillation, maturation, and bottling. I'm going to quickly talk you through how that's done. So the first one is malting. What we do is we take the barley, which is in the top left-hand corner of the screen here. We soak it in hot water for three days until it becomes saturated, and we put it out on this floor that you can see in the bottom left here. This is called a malting house, and that's a malting floor. While the barley is on the malting floor, it starts to grow. That's the picture in the top right hand there. You see the little shoots coming out of the barley. As it grows, the starches are turned into sugars by enzymes within the, within the, the barley. We are going to need the sugars later on to turn into alcohol. After a few days process, we have malted barley that we then dry. We have to re-dry it so we can move on to the next stage. Some whiskey makers dry it just with a dry heat. Some in North America particularly maybe use some wood smoke to dry their barley. And here in Scotland, we use a resource called peat, P-E-A-T. Peat is mineral rich earth that, grew, that, that is just in the ground in the west of Scotland. We cut it out, we dry it, it becomes very hard and it turns into a fuel. When we smoke, when we dry the barley with the smoke from the peat, it gets a beautiful smoky flavour. The very last two whiskies I'm going to try today are going to be smoky whiskies, and I hope in future, if you want to come back to this, you'll be able to find them too. So we've malted the barley. Next, we're going to mill it. So on the left-hand side at the top, we have, we have a mill here. So the barley is going to go through that. And once it's all broken up, it looks like this on the bottom, and we call that grist. We have to break the barley apart so we can get at the sugars in the next process. The next process is called mashing. So we take it on and we put it into a huge cooking pot. That's the picture in the bottom left-hand corner. That cooking pot is called a mash tun, and we're going to add a ton and a half of grist to it, and then we're going to put water in. Now, when we do it at the, the Clydeside distillery, we put 5,000 litres in three times. Each time we do it, we heat that water up and it extracts the sugar. We take it out and it's going to go on to the next stage. The third time we add the water, it doesn't go on to the next stage. It just extracts the last sugars from the grist. We put it aside and we use it in the next water. So one, two, go on to the next stage. The third one is reserved. We clean out the hopper, we put more grist in, we use that water again with a little bit of sugar. Now we've got 10,000 litres of sugary barley water that we call wort, W-O-R-T. And it's going to go on to the next stage. The next stage is called fermentation. Basically, if there's any beer makers out there, you know this already, we're going to turn this sugary water into a beer. And to do that, we're going to add yeast to it. So yeast basically is going to go in here. Now, the top two pictures there are of the cylinders that we do this in. They are called washbacks. They are about 20 feet high. They are quite often made out of wood, but can be made out of other, um, um, other materials. The ones in my distillery are made out of aluminium. We're going to put the wort in there. We're going to add the yeast and we're going to heat it up to body temperature. That's what's happening in the bottom picture. Yeast loves sugar. All it wants to do is eat sugar. And as it eats up the sugar in the wort, it converts it to two things carbon dioxide and alcohol, ethanol. After it's done its job, it's going to have made a beer and that beer is going to be about 9% alcohol. And we're going to take that on and we're going to distill it after that. Now, 
distillation. In Scotland, I know there are people here definitely from North America. I think there are people from Ireland. I definitely saw people from um, Australia and all that. And I definitely see people from the Caribbean. Hello, everyone. In Scotland, traditionally, we distill our whiskey twice. North America and Ireland are more typically three distillations. That makes an easier, smoother sipping whiskey, but takes quite a bit of the character out, which is why in Scotland, there are five different regions and so close to each other. And in North America and Ireland, most of the whiskies have a similar profile. They either smoky or not, but they are very, very similarly made. So as you can see here, this is a huge, huge still room in one of the big Speyside distilleries. I think this is Glen Livett, but I'm not sure. I should have checked when I took the picture. These stills work in pairs. So there are five sets of two, and they are doing one distillation each. So two in total for each of the five. So two distillations, five on the go at any one time. The idea of making it is that you start on the left-hand side of this picture in the first still with the beer you've just made called Wash. You distill that to take alcohol out originally, and then you transfer it into the second still on the right-hand side, which is called the spirit still. Once you've done the two distillations and it's passed through the spirit safe, which is this guy in the middle, it's going to go down. Some of it's going to get siphoned off and not used in the whiskey making process. And the rest, if you can see the blue line there that says spirit receiver, and then the man down at the bottom who looks like he's riding a bike, but he's actually filling barrels. That's what's going to go on, go into barrels and ultimately make whiskey. So it's a two stage process. First distillation in the wash still on the left, second distillation in the spirit still on the right, flowing through the safe in the middle and ultimately into barrels. The other stuff that doesn't get used is reused later on in another process in the whiskey making industry. So we've distilled the whiskey, sorry, we've distilled the spirit and we've put it into barrels. The next stage is maturation. We have to put the whiskey into the barrels. So you see, I've got some barrels in the top left-hand side out by the water. I've got this rogue picture of Ard Beg here that I couldn't seem to get taken off this picture. So I left it in, it's nothing to do with the barrels. And at the bottom here, I've got some virgin American oak casks that are being, that are being flamed inside. All whiskey casks are either toasted or burned on the inside. Toasted is a very light burn. Actually burning it can be as long as 55 seconds to a minute to give you a dark char on the inside of your barrel. That will bring out different flavors as the whiskey matures. If you didn't do that, your whiskey would just taste sort of oily and grassy and pretty much get very little color. So it goes to maturation. And then finally, the end of all of it, there is bottling. And in here, I have stuck the whiskies that we are going to, well, I am going to be tasting. So I have an Ockintosh and American Oak, Glenfiddich 12 year old, Glen Farkless 10, and then Springbank 10 and Ardbeg 10, all readily available around the world. That's how you make whiskey. Now I wanted to talk about a few quirks about the making of, whis of Scotch whiskies. Now, for the lady who was a little bit apologetic about drinking Dewar's, some of the best whiskies are amazing blended whiskies. Up until about 40 years ago in Scotland, nobody was really interested in single malt whiskies. They were all interested in blends. I'll come on to what blended whiskies mean. In a, in a little while, but this is a very famous whiskey in Scotland. This is called Dimple. We have a bottle of it in the distillery, and whenever one of our guests walk past it, if they come from Scotland, they always stop and stare at it 
because everybody had one of these in their grandparents' house when they were growing up. It's a funny shaped bottle and it's got a net over it like a Spanish wine bottle. So a few notes on the quirks of whiskey. So there are a few laws that govern the production of the spirit and it can't be called Scotch whiskey until it fulfills all of those things. So it must be made in Scotland. That's all the whiskies I'm talking about tonight, bar this one maybe, are made in Scotland. It must be matured in Scotland. So it goes into barrels and it goes into warehouses all over Scotland and it stays in the country. It must be matured in oak casks. Scotch whisky uses lots and lots of different types of oak casks, be it American white oak or European oak, different casks with that have had sherry in them before, Madeira in them before, rum even, lots of different things. So as long as it's in an oak cask, you're okay. There are some that are, that are illegal, but I don't need to go into them just now. It must be in the cask for a minimum of three years. So a minimum of three years it has to spend in the cask. Until that point, you can only call it spirit. After three years, you can take it out of the cask and call it Scotch whiskey. Now, most of the whiskies that we are tasting today are a minimum of 10 years in a cask. I don't know what you've got. I, I definitely noticed somebody mentioning a 24 year old whiskey that they had, but most of the things I've picked are quite simple, straightforward, 10 to 12 year old whiskies. So at that point, you can call it Scotch whiskey. I've included this picture on the left hand side. This is Macaloni's Caledonian Glenloy Island Single Malt Whiskey. This is a whiskey that's made and matured in Canada, or it was, I should say. But basically, that bottle says everything on it except the word Scotch whiskey. These guys were taken to court and were told to cease and desist with all of these words. They couldn't use Caledonian, they couldn't use Glenloy, they couldn't use Island. Um, and I think there's a couple of other words on their other whiskies that they couldn't use. They were trying to say that it was a Scotch style whiskey, but you're not allowed to because it didn't fulfill any of the laws there on that, on that page that I have. So that's the Canadian whiskey. I got asked about that once on tour by somebody and I was luckily enough to have all that in my head so I could explain why it, why it wasn't a Scotch whiskey. There are only a few things called Scotch here in Scotland. The word Scotch, for the most part, is actually an insulting word to Scottish people. If you were to call me Scotch, I would be offended because that was what in the old days, in the colonial days and everything, the patriarchy the ruling elites would refer to Scottish people as, as Scotch. So now the only things that we refer to in Scotland as Scotch rather than Scottish is Scotch whiskey, of course, a Scotch egg in the top left-hand corner, that's a boiled egg with sausage meat around it and then deep fried in breadcrumbs, it's really beautiful. Top right is Scotch beef, Underneath it is Scotch lamb, and to the left of it, that sword is called a Scotch broadsword. I include that because I have recently taken up learning how to fight with a Scotch broadsword. And if I can give you any, um, if I can give you any advice, I would say don't wait till you're 50 years old to start to learn how to to use a Scotch broadsword. It's killing me. It's absolutely killing me, but I love it. And of course, the other thing that you can call Scotch is Scotch mist, which you can see here running over the glens of the country. Okay, this is a question I'm sure probably people have answered, asked in the chat, but I want to deal with it here. So what's the difference between a single malt, a double malt, and a blended whiskey? Now, first of all, 
they are all valid and they all have their place within the whiskey pantheon. A single malt whiskey is made in one distillery only. The spirit from the stills can be put into different types of barrels and married together later to create a particular flavor profile. So what, I, what I've used to demonstrate that is rather than Scotch whiskies, I've used two Japanese whiskies on the left-hand side that are single malt whiskies, and then this amazing Australian whiskey called Sullivan's Cove that's made in Tasmania and has won so many awards. It's an absolutely brilliant, brilliant single malt whiskey. You can't call it Scotch, you call it Tasmanian single malt whiskey. But all of these whiskies originate from one distillery through one set of stills, and they're in are barreled and stored together. A blended whiskey is a mixture of different barrels from different distilleries brought together by a master blender to create a familiar flavor profile. I've illustrated this with the most famous and biggest selling whiskey in the world, Johnny Walker Red Label, and one that would be more familiar to people here in the UK, famous Grouse Whiskey. These are two excellent blended whiskies. A blend is brought together for a particular reason. It's to fulfill a flavour profile that people like. The original Johnny Walker was a grocer here in Scotland in the 19th century. And he would buy different casks of whiskey from different distilleries. He would blend those whiskies together to make flavor profiles that people like. Kind of much in the same way that people buy coffee these days with different origins and they mix them together. Johnny Walker made really successful flavored blended whiskies from casks from many different distilleries. That's why he's still the biggest, most famous whiskey in the world today. And that means that if you are in San Francisco or Singapore, if you see a bottle of Johnny Walker Red Label, you know you're getting the same flavor profile. These are the types of whiskies that are for mixing. They are for particularly puddings with scotch and soda and maybe making along with uh, cocktails. That's what they're for. These are the guys that you put the Coke into. Single malts, maybe a bit of water, maybe a bit of ice if you like it, but we try to keep them pure. Every whiskey has its place. A double malt whiskey is a fancy way of saying a blend. So here's a New Zealand whiskey, which is also very tasty, called Deggers and Ditch. Double malt means it's come from more than one distillery. It's a malt from two places, double malt. Not to be confused with double cask. So you can see both of these whiskies. Well, the one on the left, the Macallan says double cask. The one on the right says Tempranillo cask edition. <clears throat> these two whiskies, they have started life in one type of cask. So say an American oak bourbon cask and then they have been transferred into a different cask. The Macallan has been transferred into a sherry cask, as has the Tamnavulan on the right. So that's double cask. That spirit was all made in one distillery, put into one cask, and then transferred to a second to get the two flavor profiles. Different to a blend, which comes from several distilleries, and is blended together to make a flavor. I hope that makes sense. Can I put ice in my single malt? Hell yes. I'm not a whiskey snob. Now here's the thing. Some people like ice in their whiskey. Some people like whiskey stones. Some people like their whiskey cold. Some people like their whiskey warm. But bear in mind, when you put ice into a whiskey, it becomes cold and it will become watered down. 
if you really want to taste your whiskey and get all the flavors from it, you want it to be warm. You want it to be room temperature. The whiskies I'm going to be tasting, I have had sitting out here beside me for about two hours to come up to room temperature. The flavors in a whiskey is essential oils. They come from mostly from the barrels, but a lot of it is in the making of the whiskey at the beginning. The warmer you can get an oil, the more aroma will come off of it. So to really taste and, and nose a whiskey, you want it to be room temperature or warm. There is absolutely nothing wrong with adding ice to your whiskey, but just be aware that that's what it's doing. It's making it cold, it's taking the flavors away, and it's watering it down a little bit. But I always say to people, I've been on holiday in very hot places where I've been sitting at a table next to people really, really hot, and they're drinking extremely expensive whiskey over loads of ice. Do you know what? It's not how I would necessarily do it, but the environment is hot. It's a hot day and they want a cold whiskey and that's how they enjoy it. Enjoy it your way. It's your drink. Save the blends for mixers, for Coke, for lemonade, for whatever else you want to put in it, but drink scotch whiskey neat and savour it maybe with a bit of ice. Okay. This is something people might have at, might ask. I noticed somebody actually in the uh, chat saying that they were drinking this Lafroig quarter cask, bit too medicinal for my taste, but we're going to come on to another Isla malt that I love. Scotch whiskey does not have an E in it. You can see that in the Lafroig label, whereas Irish whiskey does have an E in it. You can see that also in this picture on the left-hand side, you have an American whiskey, Yellow Rose Texas whiskey. I haven't tried it, it looks beautiful. It has an E in it because American whiskey distillers really like the Irish flavors and profiles. So when they were making their whiskeys, they made it in a similar way, triple distilled. And because they like Irish, they have put an E in their whiskey. The Japanese, on the other hand, learned their whiskey distillation from the Scots, so they prefer the flavour profiles of the Scotch whiskies, and therefore they don't have an E in them. So why is that? Right, I've got no pictures for this, because everybody, I need you to swear that this goes no further than here. You don't tell anyone about this at all. There's no E in Scotch whiskey, because in the 19th century, a lot of it was absolute garbage. Scotch whiskey was really bad in the 19th century. Ireland had really hit the nail on the head and was making really beautiful, consistently good whiskies. So to distance themselves from this inferior Scotch at the time, they added the letter E to their whiskey so that basically someone, if they didn't know, they could look at two bottles and they could see the one with the, even if they didn't read, they could see the one with the extra E in it and know that it was an Irish whiskey and it would be better quality than the Scotch. That's not the same these days. Scotch whiskey, I would say, outstrips Irish whiskey. Ireland captured the American market during prohibition and has gone from strength to strength, making the flavors and profiles of whiskies that the North American palate really likes. So they have never really diversified. As far, as far as my aware, there are less than 10 distilleries in Ireland to this day, but they are massive and they're making huge amounts of whiskey. So that's it. The extra E in Irish and American whiskies started to do with marketing. And it was all to do with Scotch in the 19th century being inconsistent and not very good. Okay, who fancies a drink with this handsome guy here? So what we're going to do now, if you have a dram, just drink along if you'd like to. If you don't want to, just savour it. And as I say, if you've been really intrigued by this, come back to this tour later. It's free on the website for all time. Fast forward through all my nonsense at the beginning and just come to this section with the five whiskies 
and drink along with me. Here are the five whiskies we'll be tasting. So the five regions, Lowlands Whiskey, Ochintoshan American Oak is the first one we're going to try. Secondly is Highlands, and that's the Glen Farkless 10-year-old. Third is the Speyside Whiskies, a name you probably all know, Glen Fiddich, 12-year-old, the biggest Scotch whiskey maker in the world. Well, in Scotland as well, but that's the big, it's the biggest Scotch whiskey. From Campbelltown, the little region that some people hadn't heard of, I'm so glad to introduce you to a bit of Campbelltown, Springbank 10. And then from Isla, out on the West Coast, off the mainland, we have my favourite whiskey in the whole world, which is called Ardbeg, and it's a 10-year-old. So I'm going to whiz you around the regions. There are the bottles for reference. So Ockintoshan, Glen Farkless, Glen Fiddich, Springbank and Ardbeg. That's, that's them. I, I have drunk all of them. I like most of them. Again, let's come back to the five regions. We're going to start in the lowlands. We're going to go to the highlands. Then we're going to go to Speyside, come down to Campbelltown, and then finish on Isla. Isla has the strongest flavours. So let's start in the lowlands. That's Glasgow and Edinburgh. We're going to be drinking Ochintosh, and you can see it's just north of my city, Glasgow. There it is there. I've picked this whiskey for two main reasons, particularly for a North American palate, which I think the majority of people are here. Ochintoshan is one of the few Scotch whiskey distilleries that distill three times. So it's smoother and easier drinking and more familiar to the North American palate. Secondly, it's matured in beautiful American white oak barrels that have had bourbon in it before. Another bit of flavour profile that I find all of my North American guests really love. People from all around the world love this whiskey. I wanted to give you a few ideas if you were coming and you were spending time in the lowlands outside of Glasgow and Edinburgh of things you might like to do. So I've got a few ideas. This is my favourite place to go to outside of Glasgow. It's about 45 minutes. It's the Robert Burns Heritage Museum in Alloway near Ayr. Robert Burns is Scotland's national poet. You'll all know at least one poem by Robert Burns because you all, all know Auld Lang Syne. Should old acquaintance be forgot, never brought to mind. Should old acquaintance be forgot for Auld Lang Syne. For Auld Lang Syne means old times forgotten. Burns was a ploughman and a farmer and he grew up and lived south of Glasgow. He wrote all his poetry all over Scotland and this is a great visit. So the Robert Burns Heritage Museum is my first recommendation to you. They have the birthplace cottage, they have a heritage centre, and they have a walkway of statues all referencing Burns' poems. He wrote a poem called Tea Moose, from which um, John Steinbeck got the name of his book of Mice and Men, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang after Glee. Uh, in it, so that's a great place to visit. Another place I'd like to I'd like to point you at is also in Ayrshire, and I like it because um, most people, including a lot of Scottish people, can't pronounce it properly. Yes, you're all saying Colzean at the moment, but it's actually pronounced Colleen Castle. So this is Colleen Castle. You can see it's very dramatic. It's on the side of cliffs here in the south of Ayrshire, south of Glasgow. Beautiful, stately home and absolutely well worth a visit. One other thing to go over to the east coast of the lowlands of Scotland, this is Jedburgh Abbey. This is a ruined, one of the many ruined abbeys in the United Kingdom, but it's a really, really great example of it. Jedburgh Abbey is in the southwest, sorry, the southeast of Scotland, very close to the English border. And the other thing I want to point out is directly across from that abbey, is the Abbey View Cafe and Bookshop, owned by my friends Paul and Kate O'Neill. So if you're ever in Jedburgh looking at the Abbey, go in and say hello from me. Kate's from, Kate is also from Philadelphia, in fact. Paul is from Glasgow. Now, let's taste the whiskey. So I have it right here. Um, I wonder if I, I can't remember how to stop sharing a screen. We'll go back one. 
Okay, I've got the whiskey here. I'm having a little taste of it. Oh, thank you, Mara. I'm on screen now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I am a complete Luddite when this comes to it, Mara. Thank you very much. So here we are. I've got the first whiskey of tonight. Drink along with whatever you are drinking. Again, it's a great resource for you. Oh, a Glen Morangy Sautern cask finished. Beautiful, beautiful whiskey. Hello, welcome. So I've got this whiskey. The light here is not that great. It's very light in colour. All American oak casks give you a very light coloured whiskey. Right on my nose, I'm going to get flavours like caramel and, um, oh, someone's having an Ockintoshin with you. Hello, Jean. Hi there. Um, caramel and vanilla comes through really, really strong on the palate here as well. And a big flavour that I absolutely love every time I taste this whiskey is green apples. The green apples just come through absolutely really strongly, like you've taken an apple out of the fridge. Oh, there's another person. Hello, Nicholas, you're drinking Ockintosh and welcome. Um, well, let's have a wee drink of it then. Green apples, cinnamon, uh, sorry, uh, caramel, vanilla, coconut. Coconut comes through as well. Mmm. <laughs> I'm sorry for the people who are in Sydney and it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Glen Deverin's a beautiful drop of splosh as well. Wow. So all these beautiful, really, really, the spirit is so beautiful and fresh on the mouth. Take your, <laughs> it's, it's all right. It does taste a bit like Earl Grey tea. You're okay. Um, the spirit is so fresh. As I leave it to linger in my palate, as it gets really long, I get lots and lots of toffee flavours at the end of it and a bit of spice. It's such a beautiful, easy... Yes, this is live. We're live at the moment. You can go back and watch it at another point. So, I'm going to have another... I've got five to get through here, guys, but I'm not going to drink them all. Mm. I was just going to give you that advice, Austin. Maybe you should yeah. only take a sip of each. Or we, might, I, we, we may only get to three and a half. Right. I, are we out of time? No, we're not out of time. You may oh, be fantastic. you may be off your rocker by the end. Oh, I'll, I'll be I'll be honestly I'll be trying to take my trousers off over my head. I've got water. Anyway, as long as so you much. don't stand up, we're fine with that. Well, we're absolutely fine, right? I'm going to put this one down. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful drink. Search it out if you don't know it. I'm so glad to see that there are people here who do know it. Um, I will comment on Drambu towards the end. Yes, absolutely. Um, right, fantastic. Can I go back to my screen, please, Mara? Did I just do screen sharing here? Yes, screen share. Fantastic. Right, go back to... Well, it seems to have gone back on to... Now on with the whiskey. Let me just scoot through this one. It's gone back a few. Yeah, that's... So, it seems to have gone on a few pages there. This is where we're going to go next. So we're going to go to this region. Now look at this region, it's absolutely enormous. This is the Highland region of Scotland. And in the middle, you can see the lighter bit between Tomatin and Ardmore in the middle. That lighter bit is Speyside. We're going to come on to it next. Now, Highland whiskies are a little bit heavier. They're a little bit more floral. They have a lot of honey flavors in them and a lot of sweetness. They're quite often matured in sherry casks. So this is what we're going to come on to next. This is an absolutely amazing whiskey called Glen Farkless. Glen Farkless is just on the edge of Speyside and Highland. It's a 10 year old and it's been in a sherry cask throughout that time. Now, sherry, for anybody who doesn't know, is a fortified wine from the southwest of Spain. When you fortify a wine, you make it stronger by adding extra sugar and the yeast turns it into extra alcohol. When you fortify the grapes that it's made out of, you get, start to get flavours like raisins, currants and sultanas, and you also get spice. So let's have a little, let's see. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to take you through, sorry, first of all, uh, a few things you can do in the Highlands before we actually get to the tasting. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm enjoying this whiskey. Here are a few things you can do in the Highlands while you're working up an appetite to get to your whiskey. First of all, 
you have to go to Loch Ness and you have to go to Urquhart Castle here at the bottom. For anyone again, I will just say that one more time, Urquhart Castle, Urquhart Castle. Loch Ness is the longest loch, sorry, the, sorry, Loch Ness is the largest lake in, in the UK by volume. It's incredibly deep. So that's why a monster can hide in it quite easily. But on the banks of Loch Ness, you also have this amazing ruined castle called Urquhart Castle. Please go and visit it when you're here. Also, go to the Isle of Skye and also go to Elan Donan Castle. So in the top right hand corner, you will know this. I'm going to say that, well, I'm going to say Highlander, first of all, the film from the 1980s with Christopher Lambert and Sean Connery. And then I'm going to say the dreaded Outlander, which is a great TV series uh, that's filmed mostly here in Scotland and North America. They all use this as a backdrop. Elan Donan Castle, it means the island of Donan. Donan was an old, uh, an old, um, um, friar who lived in Scotland in the sixth century. The rest of the pictures around here are all from Skye. So going from the top left, that is the fairy pools. The fairy pools are in the middle of nowhere in Skye. Go to them, but you have to walk for a few miles to get there. You can't take a bus in. Underneath that, this is the capital of Skye. This is the beautiful town of Portree. And Portree is over towards the east coast of Skye. Absolutely picture perfect, beautiful painted houses all over. Great place to stay in there. Loads of great little hotels, quirky little places. Great place for food and drink. And every bar has great whiskey in it. To the right hand side, this is a standing stone formation called the Old Man of Storr. You can see it from the roadside as you're traveling through the country. It's just the most beautiful place. Uh, there's legends attached to it. I think I'm probably going to overrun, so I'm not going to talk about the legend, but you can go and look up the old man of Storr. What else? There is an amazing road around the north of Scotland called the North Coast 500. You can start in the bottom right hand corner. That's the city of Inverness and you can go all the way around there. It's great for driving. It's amazing for motorcyclists. And if you're really hardy, it's really good bicycling as well. So a great, great road right around the top of Scotland. I've done about two thirds of it. I'm going to finish the rest of it this year when I'm going to go up and end up in John O'Groats and Wick in the top right corner and go off over to Orkney the island group off the top of Scotland. Just wanted to show a couple of things that you can see on the uh, North Coast 500. So these beautiful mountains, the heather on the left hand side, beautiful clear water bays with white sand and caves and headlands all the way around. It's such a stunning place to go to. I think the final place I want to mention here, or final two places are the Culloden Battlefield, which is just outside of um, Inverness, it's just six miles to the east of Inverness. Culloden was the last land battle fought on British mainland in 1746. It was fought against the forces of the, uh, the pretender, Bonnie Prince Charlie, who came to try and reclaim his throne for the Stuart dynasty. So that was like, Charles I, James I, Charles II. Um, he ultimately lost in Culloden and was exiled back into mainland France and ultimately Italy. It's covered a lot in Outlander as well, but the experience and the battlefield and the heritage centre are amazing to go to and they're right beside Inverness. And right beside the Culloden battlefield, another one for the... Um, Outlander fans, is this place. This place is called Clava Cairns. It's a 4,000 year old Neolithic site. It has these amazing cairns that you can see in the three pictures, top right, bottom right, bottom left, and it also has standing stones. Now, standing stones, you will find people at these standing stones touching them because of the Outlander connection, but nobody knows what this site was for, but it's such an amazing place to visit. 
it's about a 15 minute walk from Culloden Battlefield or if you have a car you can get to it you can't go to it in a big bus the bridge is not safe but it's so worth going to so that's Clava Cairns right that's the last thing I think oh nope I've put in the beautiful Glencoe as well Glencoe is a beautiful um valley in the north of Scotland heading on the way up to Fort William and Inverness Beautiful in the summer, beautiful in the winter. The top left picture and the one on the right are a mountain called Buchel Etiv Moor, which means the Great Shepherd of Etiv, and they are amazing to go and see. Let's drink the whiskey. Glen Farkless, as I started saying, jumping the gun, 10 years old, unpeated, really sweet, a little bit of saltiness to it. Oh, thank you. A little bit of saltiness to it as well but it's matured in that um, sherry cask. So really rich sherry flavors, just such an amazing flavor. If you have it, not many people are gonna have it. I don't know, Say, give me a holler if you have. I'm just gonna have a little taste of it. Really rich fruits, cinnamon, spices, everything comes on it. While you're really? while you're taking that little bit of a sip, why don't you tell us yeah. about the glass you're using and is it important? Let me tell you about the glass I'm using. Thank you very much, actually. Um, these glasses are called Glen Cairn glasses. They come in different sizes, actually. I have a, a medium-sized one here as well. And I also have, with a bit of water in it, I have a large-sized one as well. But the idea of a Glen Cairn glass is that the bowl here, the wider part, catches a lot of the flavours, a lot of the fumes from the oils and the whiskies coming up. And it, and it captures them in the top here, like a funnel. Um, takes the great, great flavours in there. Glencairn glasses can be bought from all over the place. You can buy them online. And usually when you come to Scotland and you do a distillery tour, you get given one. This one is actually from the distillery I work in. I don't know if you can see the logo if I put it against something dark. Little bit of the logo there. TCD, the Clydeside Distillery. Yeah, so the shape blooms the whiskey here, makes it expand, and then the fumes come up and are narrowed and they can narrow right into your nose. So the Glen Farkless, beautiful sherry flavors, it's really easy drinking. There's honey in there as well. There's some spice like cinnamon as well. Mm. Oh, fantastic. I'm going to move on from here. Oh, so someone had the, thinks they smell, it's more floral and didn't taste the, the, the cinnamon or the spice. That's great. People, smell different things in different whiskies. I, I don't tend to get the florality. And to be perfectly honest, I said to Mara at the start, I've got a bit of a cold. So uh, I'm picking up the 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 the, the, the higher flavours, the, the kind of spices and things in it. If you're tasting flowers, absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Let's move on to the next one. So here we are. Back to this one. Let's move to the next. So we're moving into Speyside. Now, Speyside is the most famous area of whiskies in the whole in the whole of Scotland. This is the kind of the people that people really like the most. So you can see names here if you're looking into them. Macallan, Tamdu, Knockandu, Dufftown, Glenlivet, Glenalaki. Really, really big names. Milton, Glenlossie. What we are going to taste later on is going to be the Glenfiddich 12-year-old, an absolute classic in its style. And it's going to be very floral and it's going to be very, very mild and have like lots and lots of really nice sweet honey flavors. But before we get there, I want to point you at a couple of things you can do in Speyside. So number one, you could visit the Cairngorm National Park. Cairngorm National Park is um, in the center of Speyside. It's beautiful, it's mountains all over. They have deer there, they have um, a funicular railroad, and they have locks that you can spend some time on on the water. If you want to go fishing, you can buy a permit and fish on the River Spey. 
I've just realized this photograph has not tessellated correctly. There's actually pictures underneath it. I had a picture of people actually fishing and I had a fishery shop, so that's not quite worked. But there's a gentleman who's been fishing and that's the, the size of salmon and trout that you can get in the rivers of Speyside. Also, the most popular thing to do in Speyside is go on the whiskey trail and see as many distilleries as you can. There's the whiskey trail. There's the points in the brown labels, uh, the brown signs to all the different distilleries. It's so worth doing. They're also close together. Hire a car and a driver for the day or use the public transport that's, that's really good in the area and get around and see as many distilleries. And finally, stop and have lunch in Deans of Huntley. So Deans make amazing shortbread and they're in the town of Huntley. They have a cafe, you can see there, a gift shop and a great afternoon tea with all their great shortbread. So I knew this one would be shorter. The last two are also shorter because there's less to do in them and there's more whiskey to talk about. I've now got the Glen Fiddich 12 year old. So here it is, an absolute classic. Mara will, put me, Mara will put me on the screen. Thank you very much. Um, Royal Whiskey Society, remind me about that at the end. Getting my nose right into the Glenfiddich, if anybody is joining me with something like this, it is, it's flowers, it's honey, it's sweetness. Speyside whiskies are very elegant, they're very light, they're often often they're referred to a little bit disparagingly as breakfast whiskies, really easy to drink whiskies, but they're not the most favorite type of whiskey in the world for a, for, for a reason. All the grammar was wrong there. They're incredibly popular. They're easy drinking whiskies and they are so tasty. So I've had all this flowers in there, really, really flowery, oh, lavender, a bit of lavender, a bit of honey in there. I'm just gonna take a quick taste. This is a great whiskey for those in Australia since it's breakfast time for them. Absolutely, absolutely. Our, so really quickly, our whiskey is expensive to buy. Depends what you buy. A, a decent single malt whiskey, upwards of 35 pounds. I can't do that in dollars right off the top of my head. Um, and they can go up to thousands of pounds for a bottle. A bottle like this, not expensive. They make a lot of it. You get it all over the world. It's a famous triangular bottle. Glenfiddich means the glen of the deer. That's why they have a deer on the front of their bottle and you can find it all over the world. So, so tasty and sweet. Not my favorite type of whiskey, but so popular. I've introduced so many people to whiskey, either with Auchintoshin or Glenfiddich or Glenlivet. Really beautiful flavors. On the tongue, oh, it's really, really nice. I could drink a lot of that. I'm not going to. Excellent. Right, the last two are really, really quick because there's not much else to do in these areas except drink your whiskies. So next, we're going to go into Campbelltown. So I heard a few people at the beginning saying they hadn't heard of Campbelltown as a region and hadn't heard of Springbank. Campbelltown is tiny. It's on the Kintyre Peninsula. The whiskey we're going to be drinking is Springbank. Now, my distillery got an allocation of these bottles and a few different ones just before Christmas. We sold out in less than two weeks. People were desperate for this whiskey. It's really nice. When we come on to it, it's going to be peaty. It's going to be a little bit smoky, but it's got a kind of, they call it the Campbelltown funk. They have a kind of like a funkiness to the drink. What can you do in Campbelltown? Well, well, in the, the Kintyre Peninsula, you may know that Paul McCartney wrote a song called Mull of Kintyre. It was, to, it was inspired by the farm that he used to own on the Kintyre Peninsula. The farm was called Highland Park Farm. Go and visit the old farm there. There's some pictures of him in the 1970s. He said he was never happier than when he was at his farm in the Kintyre Peninsula. The Mull of Kintyre is a certain part of the, of the Kintyre Peninsula, but that's the whole of the peninsula. And at the end of it is where Campbelltown is and all the distilleries. Visit Campbelltown itself. It's a beautiful place to go to. It's hard to get to. You can go by car, it takes hours. You can go by ferry, it's quicker. You can fly with Logan Air, it's quicker still. 
But here we go. I'm going to get onto this spring bank. I don't think anyone's got it. Holler if you've got the spring bank, of course. But if not, I'm just going to get into this. So the spring bank really, really is beginning to get darker, darker colours. Fantastic. Campbelltown whiskey. Gene, nice to see that you like Campbelltown whiskey. There's a song called Campbelltown Loch. I wish you were whiskey. I would drink you dry. So you've got a little bit of smoke here. You've got some dark colours. You've got an amount of honey and florality as well, but there's a bit of peatiness coming through. There's a bit of saltiness coming through as well. I'm going to take a quick taste of this guy as well. I only had a small amount of that. But does Austin deliberately swirl the whiskey in his mouth before swallowing and open it up to the taste? Um, actually, no, I don't. What I do is um, when I'm, and I've probably not said this and you can't see behind the glass, I open my mouth while I'm sniffing it and it gives you more flavour in the mouth. So like that, you probably can't, yeah, you can't see it. Between my, my beard and the glass, you can't really see what I'm doing. I open my mouth in there. I don't swirl the whiskey in my mouth. It takes it to the sides of my cheeks, which I find quite acidic and I don't like it. I put it over my tongue and down my throat. Is Austin actually in Scotland? Yes, I'm in Glasgow, Scotland. <laughs> um, the Springbank, it just gets that really saltiness. There's a kind of like, in the nicest possible way, there's a bit of feet there. Um, but it's like, it, it, it goes really, really nicely. So the Springbank 10, saltiness, a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of smoke in there. That's that, that's that, that's that one. Let me just finish this. Yeah. There's also, it's so much, so much alcohol when it first hits your nose as well. I didn't really, that's my cold. I didn't notice that till I got the second hit of it there. But really, really good alcohol, strong finish on it, amazing taste. Now, let's go back to the very last region, my favorite region. Here we are. This one's really quick because basically the only reason to go to Isla, apart from how beautiful it is, is for the distilleries. Now look at this. This is 127 square miles. The copper colored stills you can see there are all distilleries that are bottling. The pink ones are all old distilleries that have restarted but are not yet bottling. And the two purple ones are two brand new distilleries. When you add that up, that 127-mile island of Isla has 14 distilleries. It's amazing. So there's eight that are bottling. And my favourite whiskey of all time is this guy. This is the Ardbeg 10-year-old. It's salty. It's CBD. It's full of iodine. It's not like any of the other whiskies we've tried so far. I just want to show you. People come here for the whiskies, so I just wanted to show you a picture of all eight of the distilleries. So you've got up in the top left, sorry, we'll start on the right, that's Lagavulin, Beaumore, Ardbeg, and top left is Lafroig for the people who were drinking Lafroig quarter cask. The next four are Kilcoman, Bunahaben, which means at the mouth of the river, Bruichladi, and Kalila, which means the sound of Isla. So this thin strip of water between the two bits of land. These are the eight distilleries that are bottling. They all make amazing whiskies. Check them all out. They are absolutely amazing. But now what I'm going to do is I'm literally just going to taste this last one. So when the picture comes back up, I'm going to absolutely confound you with my glass. Because I'm not using a Glen Cairn glass anymore. I'm using my Ardbeg glass. So this is similar in idea to a Glen Cairn. Look at that bowl there. The bowl is concentrating all the flavors together and then it's coming up, and narrowing at the rim. It's in the same color as the bottle of an Ardbeg bottle, dark, dark green. This whiskey is absolutely amazing. I put my nose in here and immediately, I'm immediately transported back to Isla where I've been several times. It just smells of the sea. It smells of salt, it smells of seaweed. Ardbeg leave their barrels out by the sea, so the whiskey in the barrels gets hit by the seawater, gets hit by the winds, and becomes salty. 
It's also smoked, so it's smoky as well. It's a real fireside whiskey. I did swirl that there, but what I was doing with swirling it was sucking my cheeks in at the same time. So it didn't touch my cheeks. It just touched my teeth and my mouth and the back of my throat. It's such an amazing, amazing salty whiskey. If you don't know it, go and find it. It's easy to get all over the world. If you do know it and haven't had it for a while, go and find it in a bar, go and find a bottle of it and have a drink of it. It's just the most amazing, amazing drink. That's, you know, that's really all I wanted to say about this, having a little tasting. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, and to everyone out there, um, Slangevar, Slangevar, your good health. So I have another poll I'd like to put up um, if we can do it. So let's see if I can, um, let's see if I can figure this out to do my second poll. <clears throat> we'll see here, let's see. Um, hmm. Okay, so the real question is, what drink were you enjoying during this presentation? We have choices, Scotch whiskey, another whiskey not from Scotland, wine, beer, soft drink, coffee and tea, water, or something else, or not drinking anything at all. I'll give you a minute to answer. I thought this would be fun to actually see how many people were enjoying the, the whiskey along with Austin. I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to answer. And please, if you're not seeing the question, feel free to answer on chat or on the Facebook live feed. I'm noticing people there saying that they, some of you are enjoying the Ardbeg 10. I'm so pleased. It's just yes. the most, I love it. But it looks Sanjivar, like, Sanjivar, Jean. I'm going to end the poll and share the results so that you can see. It looks like um, Austin and I are leading the way. So Austin is drinking Scotch whiskey. 32% of you are drinking along with him. And I am drinking water. And 20% of you are drinking along with me. So it was a fun night. I'm, I'm really glad to have um, been able to share this with you. And thank you, Austin, for, um, for sharing it with us, too. So I think we're going to try to go into a Q&A if Austin has any energy left. We'll see. Absolutely. If, uh, I, I, can, I can go for hours. Be oh, I, I'm sure you can. You have a little more energy in you now. I think it's like oh, yeah. gasoline yeah. at this point. Am I getting flush? Yeah, I think you're past flush. So I just want to mention before we go into the Q&A, if you are interested in a tour of Scotland, by all means, email me at marawalsh at gmail.com. I, um, I can connect you on one of our group tours or other group tours that are just as, just as wonderful. I can make sure that you can go for the amount of days you want in the month and the year that you want. So please email me and we can connect and I will get you hooked up with a Scottish tour so that you can enjoy uh, the distilleries and the land itself. So Austin, if you are ready, can we go yes. to the Q and A? Yes. You can go up to the top of the questions and do oh, your great. best to get through some of these. Well, um, while, I, while, I'm, while I'm going up to the the the, the Q and A, somebody did ask about for me to comment on Dram Beauty. Now Dram Beauty is a uh, is a whiskey liqueur. Um, it's the the legend of Drambui is that the recipe was given to the owner of the Portree Hotel. If you remember, we were in Sky there, and I showed you a photograph of Portree by Bonnie Prince Charlie when he was escaping from the 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 British government after the Battle of 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 Culloden. He said, "This is a recipe for a way I like to drink whiskey. It has honey and whiskey and spices in it." And it's a traditional drink that's been made for a very long time. I have to say, I love Dram Beauty, but I haven't drunk it for an awful long time. So maybe I should get back to drinking it. It's a beautiful, beautiful way to drink Scotch whiskey. If you're not necessarily a fan of the sourness or the, the, the strength of it, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful drink. And I think it means the drink that satisfies. Dram means drink and buoy satisfies. So... Right, so I, I think I'm starting at 10.16 with Derek Thill. Sorry if you pronounced the name wrong. What time, what's the best time of year for lovely autumnal colours? Starting in September and going right through to October. Also towards the end of September, you will get horse chestnuts dropping so you can play conkers here in Scotland, which is a great game of playing there. 
Um, oh yeah, I've heard it's best to avoid times when there's midges. Yes, absolutely. Midges are tiny little insects, uh, little like gnats, kind of like mosquitoes that are all over the West Highlands. They're usually around from May till the end of August. Uh, you can just buy um, um, face nets if you want to go in the area and you can wear long sleeves and gloves, but they are an absolute pest. They're not going to kill you. They're not dangerous, but they are really annoying. If you go to YouTube and you look up the phrase one minute midgy challenge, so M-I-D-G-E challenge, it's people taking off their face nets and trying to last a minute in the West Highlands without them on because there's so many midges. So yes, that's a good point. Avoiding the West Highlands um, in the summer months is quite a good idea. Going in September or the spring is much better. But, you know, if you can put up with the midges, it, it's an amazing place to be. What's the weather like in Dundee and things for tourists to see? The weather on the East Coast, Dundee is on the East Coast, is usually quite, is, is usually better than the West Coast. It's slightly warmer. Um, I don't know on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in Dundee, there are some amazing things now. Um, the Victoria and Albert Museum has a, a museum there. It's an amazing space with an amazing restaurant in it as well. There's the Discovery, which is the ship that Robert Falcon Scott took to the Antarctic. So you can go and visit that. Dundee is also in the past famous for three things, jute, jam and journalism. So it used to make carpets. It used to have a lot of really good journalism and um, it makes marmalade, that orange jam. There's loads of museums about all of them. There's loads of living history about the uh, the journalism that goes on in Dundee. There's a company called DC Thompson that made kids comics called the Beano and the Dandy. Uh, there's loads of things going on in Dundee. It's a really vibrant town to see. And if you go over the Tay Bridge and for about 12 miles, you end up in St Andrews in Fife, which is another amazing place to go. Um, Austin, do you have a favourite single malt and blended Scotch whiskey? So, um, Audrey, no E in Scotch. No E in Scotch. We've, just, we've covered that, but that was long beforehand. Thank you. Um, a favourite single malt, as I've just said, is, is Ardbeg. Um, really a, a blend to me. It really doesn't matter. I'm only mixing it with maybe like lemonade or Coca-Cola or turning it, into, um, turning it into a cocktail. They're all good. They're all good for doing that. Doesn't really matter about the blends as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I've been to Scotland many times, love it and agree about Edinburgh during August. Excellent. Learned so much about for a pom. <laughs> Excellent pomegranates. Hello. Um, so that's more, that's more just a comment. Hello, hello from hello from Australia. Um Monty Python flying was saying, right? Uh, yes, I don't know that. Uh, sports. You must mention Sir Jackie Stewart. Yes, fair enough. So Sir Jackie Stewart, I believe the first one of the first British winners of the World Motor Racing Championship. I know very little about motor racing, but I do know that he used to live in a house just in the northwest of Glasgow. And when I take guests past it on the way up to Loch Lomond, there's a blue plaque there for Jackie Stewart. He's a lovely man, and I believe he's still around. Good for him. Um, right, I enjoy it. Yeah. Um, when will Scotland and the distilleries open up in 2022? Well, I mean, we are technically open as long as you are vaccinated and as long as you can fulfil certain criteria to get in. A lot of distilleries are open at the moment. Most of the distilleries that close over the winter will open up round about Easter. So late March, early April. So that's smaller distilleries like Edradour and things in the Highlands and more remote ones may only open up around Easter, but a lot of distilleries are open at the moment. Scotland is open for business as long as you are vaccinated and you're, you fulfill the criteria, check with your own government before you come so you don't get sent back at the, uh, at the, at the border. Um, can you rent motorhomes and drive around? Absolutely. You can rent motorhomes, you can drive around, you can park in distillery parking lots. You can't park there overnight. You have to go to caravan, trailer park type things. But yes, there's lots of companies where you can hire motorhomes. It's a great way to get around in Scotland. I did it in an old uh, VW T, is it called a T4? I can't remember. Uh, the old classic Volkswagen 
with a friend from Canada about 10 years ago and we went up to Sky and we went over to Fife in a few days. Great way to get around. Loads of different ways to hire caravans and camp. Austin, I was yeah. supposed to remind you to speak about the Royal Whiskey Society. The Royal Whiskey Society, yeah. Um, I prefer, if you want to join a whiskey society, two different ones I would mention. Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, I think, are doing a more interesting thing. And also 1775 Whiskey Passport. These are friends of mine who also do a little whiskey thing as well. Um, I don't know so much about the Royal Society. I think they're quite old fashioned, but I really like Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. I have one of their whiskies. They do special bottlings. They're all really unusual whiskies. And I love 1775 Whiskey Passport. Is that fair enough? Um, does weather affect the travel options? Yes, particularly if you're going to use the ferries, weather will affect the travel options. If you're coming in the winter, snow and ice will affect your travel options. Also, if you're coming and it's very wet, sometimes on the little, little roads, you will end up with um, uh, landslips and they can close things off. So they do have to be factored in. Doesn't happen all the time. The worst is usually the ferries being cancelled. Um, oh, what region is Buchanan's Scotch from? Well, funnily enough, I am Clan Buchanan. My surname is Yule. We are part of Clan Buchanan. The Buchanan family come from the east side of Loch Lomond, and I believe uh, that's where they're from. Buchanan's whiskey, which I think you're maybe referring to black and white whiskey, was one of the first ever branded whiskeys at the turn of the century. James, B was it James Buchanan? Andrew Buchanan. Uh, popularized whiskey at the start of the 20th century with his black and white whiskey um, and he was from Glasgow his distillery was on the outskirts of Glasgow if I'm getting that wrong and there's a different whiskey actually called Buchanan's um, then it's most likely to come from the east side of Loch Lomond where the Buchanan family originally came from the Buchanan clan came from um, is it necessary to book well in advance if you want to take the ferry from Ullapool to Skye um, certainly at peak times, if you want to uh, get the ferry from Ullapool to Sky, but most off peak times, if ever I've got onto it, it's absolutely fine. Worst comes to worst, if you can't get on it, you can drive down and you can go on to Sky over the Sky Bridge. You do not have to get a ferry. Um, how does the wort taste when extracted? Wort is basically barley water. I don't know if, if you come across that in, in, in North America or anywhere else, but we used to have a drink here called barley water, which was flavored with citrus, lemon, and orange. Um, it's got a slightly malty taste to it, if that makes sense, but it's sweet. So maybe if you've ever come across Horlicks, but cold, I hope that helps. Um, why do you use aluminium instead of stainless steel um, in the in the washbacks, I assume that's for? Um, Personal choice, most of them, they don't make any difference. Um, aluminium is very, very long lasting as, as is stainless steel. Aluminium takes a little bit more of the impure properties out of the beer than stainless steel does. Um, and wood is the old style that's used. Um, wooden washbacks, don't last as long as aluminium or steel, but some places still find them preferable. Cool. Has anyone tried the Sassanac whiskey? So that's um, what's his name from Outlanders whiskey. Um, I haven't tried the Sassanac. It's a blend. It's a very nice bottle. And there's a lot of people who fancy um, Jamie, what's it, Jamie Fraser, and will buy that whiskey. I'm sure it's perfectly nice, but it is just a blended whiskey. It's not a single malt. I have an open bottle of from Aberdeen. Does it ever go bad? Whiskey shouldn't go bad. Whiskey doesn't get better. It doesn't get worse in the bottle. It just stays exactly the same. The only reason it would go bad is if you stored it on its side, got its cork wet, and the cork went sour. So it should be fine. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get worse. 
I'm from Kentucky where the best bourbon is made. The only bourbon is made in Kentucky, as far as I'm aware. What is the difference between bourbon and whiskey and what is a sour mash whiskey? I'll be visiting Scotland in May. So the major difference, bourbon can only be made in Bourbon County, Kentucky. There are several laws governing the making of bourbon. You can only use ingredients from within 100 miles of your distillery. You're only allowed to use um, virgin white oak, which has been flamed inside. You can flame for four different times, one, two, three, and four, which is why Jack Daniels number four, I think, is flamed for 55 seconds. Um, also, Bourbon whiskey is distilled three times, so it's smoother um, and easier drinking. Bourbon whiskey is also, by law, only has to stay in a barrel for two years. When it comes out of that barrel, it's very, very light in colour. So usually, but not always, caramel is added to it to give it a darker colour and a sweeter profile. The sweeter profiles are what, in general, North Americans seem to like in a whiskey. Scotch whiskey is only distilled twice. We can use a range of barrels to get different flavors, different colors and different profiles in them. But there are a lot of amazing um, bourbons. Um, sour mash, I'm not quite sure what the difference is with a sour mash and a bourbon. I'm not an expert on that, but that's, that's the difference with bourbons. But Tennessee and sour mashes, I, I assume that they are souring when they come to mashing which is the third process i don't know what they're doing from there are pot ale low wines and spent lees used at all so thank you alex barry so the waste products of the distillation process i didn't go into that but those waste products go into a separate vat and yes they are used we use them as our distillery first of all to make um hand sanitizer because they're high in alcohol that's one thing they're used for. Secondly, usually the waste products from the distillation process are added back into the mash still when, you, sorry, the wash still when you put the next wash in. So they're all used up. They're never thrown out. They're distilled and distilled and distilled again. So thank you for that question. I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, go into that in great detail because I knew it was kind of overrunning. Is Dimple the same as Pinch? I'm sorry, I've never seen Pinch whiskey. Send me a photo and well, let's see. Um, does whiskey continue to mature once it's been bottled? No, it doesn't get worse, it doesn't get better. Is there a link between brands of Scotch and the various Scottish clans? Not really anymore. No, they're, they're all made by uh, the distilleries, but they're mostly owned by big brands. Um, our distillery and the one that we also own, Bowmore on Isla, are independent, but they're not really clan related. What is single grain whiskey? Single grain is made in one distillery, but they don't use barley, they use grain. So like a wheat grain or something instead. I did mention that in North America, sometimes they use corn or grain instead. So a single malt is when they use barley, single grain is when they use grain and single and corn as well. Um, uh, I want to, Appreciate Scotch before you can go to before you go to Scotland next fall. I have Googled advice, but what can Austin advise about how to elevate my palate? Find find people who know about whiskey in your area. Find a bar that has nice whiskies in it. Go in, talk to the barman, talk to the people who drink whiskies and just try it. There might be a whiskey society near where you live. Try Googling whiskey society for where you are. And um a, and and take it from there. There's lots of online tutorials. My friends who run 1775 Whiskey Passport do online tutorials as well. Look them up, look up whiskey tutorials on YouTube, try them, go into bottle shops, um, see if people know about whiskey there. Just go and ask. People want to tell you about these things. People, Hopefully people are not snobbish about the whiskey. Just go and enjoy yourself. Is Campbelltown named after Clan Campbell of Scotland? Yes, it is. It used to have another name, used to have a Gaelic name, and then it used to have another name. 
Um, but it's now named after Clan Campbell. Clan Campbell were always loyal to the British crown, therefore they got a lot of advantages in Scotland. So yes, Campbelltown is named after Clan Campbell, the Dukes of Argyle. Is Auchentoshan sold in the USA? I have picked every single whiskey tonight because I know that you can get it in the USA. The Auchentoshan, I believe, is widely available. What about adding a drop of water to one's neat dram? I've heard it opens up. I did have some water actually here beside me. I didn't use it tonight. It does open up, makes it a little bit easier drinking. I just wanted to get through that tasting and have a proper taste. Add about two or three drops of water to your whiskey. See how it changes the flavor. Um, are the roads in Sky still single track and pull out? Um, a lot of roads in the north of Scotland are single track. Not all the roads on Sky are single track. They are a lot of double tracks, but when you get right into the, the wilds of, of Sky, yes, they are single track. How that works is they have passing places. If you're approaching someone, uh, if the first passing place is on the left, you pull into it. If the first passing place is on the right, the person approaching you pulls into it. It's kind of quite simple once you get it but it's, it is, it's, it's not the easiest of driving on all these small roads. But yes, there's a lot of single tracks in the north of Scotland, right out in the islands as well, but there's less cars. Um, if we don't like to be called Scotch, you'll call us Scottish. Scottish. That's what we called. I'm Scottish. Or I'm, I'm a Scot and I'm Scottish. Production of Scotch is now done by just a few large companies. Do they continue, continue to honour traditional recipes and processes? Yes, they do. The laws state here in Scotland that you have to do the traditional things. You are right. There's a lot of companies, well, of really big companies that own most of the distilleries, but they're all pretty much autonomous. They buy the distilleries because they like what they're doing. Our distilleries that we work, that I work in, the Clydeside and Bowmore, are individual um, independent distilleries. But yes, when the big guys buy them, they're not buying them to change them. They're buying them because they like what they do. It stays traditional. What brand of scotch has a smoky flavour? Well, rather than say a brand, let me point you at the last two whiskies that we tried. They were from Campbelltown and Isla. If you want smoky, ask for a Campbelltown whisky or an Isla whisky. Those are the ones that will be smoky. Glen fed a 12 every year for Christmas and so she passed away. Oh. My grandmother got a bottle of 12-year-old Glen Fiddick every year for Christmas till she died. Um, she didn't leave any behind. Well done. Well done. Fabulous. Um, sipping a very old Uscabe malt whiskey from Queen's Cross, Aberdeen, Albany House, Dundee, bottled by Grampian Television. Oh, Uscabe, which is the, uh, the, the Gallic word, which means water of life, is where the, we get the word whiskey from. You didn't mention Macduff or Banff Highland single malts. There's 134 distilleries in Scotland. I cannot mention them all. Um, I think it's the Scottish miners that lived. Okay. Spanish oak from sherry is flavoured, but is there a reason why there is these barrels available? Um, so Spanish sherry barrels are very popular for Scotch whiskey. We've had a relationship with sherry makers for centuries. Sherry making uh, goes much further back than, uh, than whiskey making as an industry. We only really started distilling whiskies in the, the late 18th, early 19th century properly. And we've been buying barrels for them ever since. So or barrels from them ever since. Sherry has a great resource of barrels because they've been making sherry for so long if that makes sense. Ardbeg with oysters. Um, I love an oyster, but personally, I don't like oysters with spirits, but it is a classic flavour that you put together. Yes, Ardbeg, that smoky, salty, seaweedy flavour with oysters would be amazing. Is a leather nose and taste characteristics of some scotches? Yes, leather does come through in a lot of scotches. Off the top of my head, another one that I really like is called Lechaig, L-E-D-A-I-G. It has saltiness, it has smoke, and it's quite leather. It's almost quite barbecue in flavours. 
So that's maybe one to check out for leather, Lechaig, L-E-D-A-I-G. Uh, living in Fifeshire many years ago, and my daughter was born in St Andrews. She was named Skye as an homage to Scotland and the Isle of Skye. Never been back, would love to visit again. Good luck. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll ignore you, Robert Kane. <laughs> Um, we had Glenn Murray. Glenn Murray is a lovely Elgin classic and Anknock. They are great, great whiskies. Um, right, Jackie Stewart, I've mentioned already. Um, can you talk about the differences between 10 and 18 year old scotches? Okay. Um, when you put spirit in a barrel every year, it gets less and less. So Every year it's going to evaporate within the barrel, just out through the wood naturally. It's going to lose two to two and a half percent of its volume. As you go after 10 years, it will have lost a certain amount of its volume in the barrel and the flavors will have become intensified and stronger. You will get colors. If you take the, oil, the whiskey out there and you've got a 10 year old, it's going to be really nice. That's what we're tasting tonight. If you leave it in another eight years in that barrel without taking it out, at the end of the day, you'll end up with less volume. You're losing two and a half percent every year, but the flavors will become more intense because it's been sitting in the barrel for longer. So more flavors, more colors, more intensity, more spice, more saltiness if you're in that area, more sweetness if you're using sherry casks. The longer you leave it, the more intense flavors you have, but the less you get. That's why a 10 year old costs less than an 18 year old. For how many years are oak barrels used? That's a kind of a how long is a piece of string. You can't really tell until you start using the oak barrels. Um, depends what kind of oak barrel it is. Sherry casks can be used quite a lot because they have a lot of flavor in them. American oak barrels may be a little bit less because they quite soon take on the flavors of Scotch whiskey rather than the flavors of American oak because they are young and new. Um, uh, Tour Isla by bicycle. Yes, fabulous. Go around Isla by bicycle, 127 miles square. You can cycle it, it's not too hilly. Really, really good fun if you can get to Isla and you can get a bike or take a bike with you. What's the best way to spend two to three days on Isla? Um, Ardbeg, Bruich Laddie, Bomore, Bunahaven, Lafroig, Lagavulin, Kilcoman, and uh, Kalila. There you are, three days on Isla. Enjoy yourselves. Um, golf and Scotch combo trip. Uh, hints for a golf and scotch uh, combo trip. Um, at most golf courses, I'm aware there is a 19th hole. 19th hole, sorry. Go in there, drink whiskey. Don't bother with the game of golf. It's a good walk spoiled. But seriously, uh, you can golf all over Scotland. There's a lot of public. Um, there's a lot of public um, uh, courses to play on. I'm not a golfer, as you can probably tell. Uh, there's a lot of companies here that do golf tours as well. You can find them just by looking online. Am I am I totally running out of time, Mara? Yes, I'm going to I'm going to ask you one final question because this yes. came up a couple times. I answered it, but I want you to answer it for them. Yes. You pronounce C-E-L-T-I-C -E as Celtic. Yes. And many people have heard it Celtic. I know yes. the difference because you've told me before, but yes. I would like you to tell the audience. OK. For the most part, that word should be pronounced Celtic. But very specifically, I can think of two specific cases, one North American. It's not the Boston Celtics, it's the Boston Celtics. And Glasgow Celtic is always pronounced that way. It's almost like I describe it as it's like a shibboleth of living in, of, of living in Glasgow. It's like a password. Um, Celtic Football Club was founded in 1888 by um, Irish priests as a working men's football club to help the poor of the East End of Glasgow. Ever since then, it has just always been pronounced Celtic. Um, so 99 times out of 100, when you see the word, you'll be pronouncing it Celtic. But the two specific times that you always pronounce it the other way is if you're talking about the Boston Celtics basketball team and Glasgow Celtic football team. It's, 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 it's really kind of like, I think maybe the other thing that I might have mentioned to you before is that 
if you're in Glasgow, you can tell a Glaswegian, that's a person from Glasgow, because they will say Glesga for the city. And anyone else out of the city who thinks they're being in with people say Glasgow. And nobody, <laughs> nobody here says Glasgow. We know you're a foreigner if you say it. So in the same way that you always say Glasgow Celtic and um, the awful, the other team, whatever their name is, um, you always say Glasgow Celtic. It's just how it's always been pronounced. I don't know why uh, it's just always been that way and it's the same in Boston. So you know that Boston is from Glasgow now. Um, and he yes. is in Scotland and it is getting very late. In fact, it is January 19th in Scotland. So we are going to end this tour. It could go on and on with my friend, but we're going to end it. So thank you so very much, Austin. Everybody enjoyed it. You brought your, your great flavor for whiskeys as well as your knowledge of Scotland. So we appreciate both. Um, and for everybody out there who's still with us, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you again next week. Take care and have a good day.